Welcome to Pediatric Videos for PedsCases.com. Welcome to Approach to Neurocutaneous Disorders, a podcast made for PedsCases.com at the University of Alberta. I am Jen Meeks. I'm Harry Liu. We are both medical students at the University of Alberta. This podcast is made for medical students and gives an organized approach to neurocutaneous syndromes. We'd like to thank Dr. Heli Goez for helping us develop this case. Dr. Goez is a pediatric neurologist at the Stollery Children's Hospital and the Glenrose Rehabilitation Hospital in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. The objective of this PEDS case are list key historical points and physical exam findings, that would lead you to suspect neurocutaneous disorder. Describe the characteristic skin lesions seen in common neurocutaneous disorders. Understand inheritance patterns of neurofibromatosis and tuberous sclerosis. Discuss the etiology of neurocutaneous disorders. Discuss how manifestation of neurocutaneous disorders can evolve over time. List the key surveillance needs of individuals with neurocutaneous disorders. Discuss the strength of a multidisciplinary approach in clinical follow-up of patients with neurocutaneous disorders. Let's start with the case. We are 30 medical student on a pediatric rotation at a community clinic. We asked to do a well child check on a six-month-old male. You start with the history. Here's what you find out. Term on complicated delivery at 39 weeks and 5 days to a healthy G2 P1 mother. He received his vaccination up to four months, and his six-month appointment is next week. He is breastfed and started solid food two weeks ago. He started to sit, can roll both, both ways, grasp object, started babbling. No recent illnesses or any parental concerns. He is at 40% higher for weight, 50 for height, 55 for head circumference. He has one sibling who is three years old and healthy. He lives with both parents at home. His father has asthma. His mother has hypothyroidism. The rest of the family history is unremarkable. You move on to the physical exam. You begin with a head to toe inspection. To your surprise, you notice five skin lesions on the baby's torso. They are a bit darker than the rest of the skin and range in diameter from 0.6 centimeters to 1.2 centimeters. They are flat and irregular in shape. You ask the mother about them. She says they have been there since birth. Here's a picture of one of the skin lesions. This is a 1.2 cm times 0.5 cm discrete uniformly pigmented light brown lesion with well demarcated but irregular border located on the right lower quadrant of his abdomen. Based on the morphology of the macule, you immediately think of cafe au lait spots. You remember that cafe au lait spots are associated with some neurocutaneous disorders. Let's review neurocutaneous disorders briefly, starting with the embryology and genetics of neurocutaneous disorders. Neural crest cells are ectodermal cells that arise from the edge of the neural plate. When the neural tube forms, neural crest cells delaminate and migrate away from the neural tube and differentiate into multiple cell types including smooth muscle cells, chondrocytes, melanocytes, neurons, and Schwann cells. Neurocutaneous disorders belong to a larger group of disorders called neurocrystopathies, disorders that arise due to problems with neural crest cells. As you can see in the diagram, neural crest cells can differentiate into a wide variety of cells and migrate throughout the developing body, which is why neurocutaneous disorders present with a range of phenotypes with multiple organ systems affected. Today we will focus on the two most common neurocutaneous disorders, neurofibromatosis and tuberous sclerosis. Neurofibromatosis is a group of disorders that includes neurofibromatosis 1, neurofibromatosis 2, and schwannomatosis. NF1 is the most common of the three with an occurrence of 1 for every 3,000. It is an autosomal dominant disorder caused by mutations in the tumor suppressor gene neurofibromin on chromosome 17. Most cases of NF1 occur de novo. 
NF2 is an autosomal dominant disorder caused by mutations in the tumor suppressor gene NF2 on chromosome 22, which encodes the protein Merlin. Like NF1, most cases of NF2 occur de novo. Both NF1 and NF2 are characterized by the growth of tumors throughout the nervous system. NF1 presents during childhood, whereas NF2 typically presents in early adulthood. For the purpose of this case, we will focus on NF1. The second most common neurocutaneous disorder is tuberous sclerosis, with an incidence of 1 in 6,000. It is an autosomal dominant disorder caused by mutations in either TSC1 or TSC2, both of which encode tumor suppressors involved in the mTOR signaling. Like NF, most cases of tuberous sclerosis occur de novo. Both NF and TS affect multiple organ systems, and in particular the skin and the nervous system. Next, we will compare the features and presentations of NF1 and TS. As mentioned previously, NF1 and tuberous sclerosis are the two most common neurocutaneous disorders. Let's briefly compare the two disorders. The skin lesions characteristic of NF1 are hyperpigmented macules known as cafe au lait spots. Cafe au lait spots are often the first presentation of NF1 and tend to increase in number throughout childhood. Axillary and inguinal freckling is also common in, N in NF1. In TS, the skin lesions are ash leaf spots which are hypopigmented and polygonal or oval shape. These can be best viewed with a wood flap. Other skin lesions in TS include chagrin patches, ungual fibromas, and facial angiofibromas, which are pathognomonic but usually appear at a later stage. TS often first presents with seizures, including infantile spasms. NF1 has a variety of neurocutaneous features in addition to the typical skin findings, including cutaneous neurofibromas. Gliomas involving the optic nerve might also be seen. In addition, individuals with NF1 have a higher risk of other CNS tumors, mainly astrocytomas and brainstem gliomas. The mean age at diagnosis for astrocytomas is 4.5 years, and the risk persists into adulthood. Patients with astrocytomas are usually asymptomatic and diagnosed incidentally on brain imaging, but the most frequent presentation is signs and symptoms associated with increased intracranial pressure. On the other hand, most NF1 patients with brain gliomas are symptomatic. In the eyes, the most common findings are Lish nodules on the iris, as well as pallor of the optic disc. Now let's go back to the case. To recap, you are seeing a six-month-old male infant in the community clinic, where you notice some hyperpigmented macules that you think are cafe au lait spots while doing a routine skin inspection. Your preceptor agrees. You are a keen medical student that recently reviewed neurocutaneous disorders, and you suggest a possible diagnosis of NF1. You continue with your complete physical exam. You do not notice any other obvious skin lesions. You move on to a neural exam. There are no nodules on either iris. Both pupils are equal and rea reactive to light. The rest of the neural exam is unremarkable. Cardiac, pulmonary, and abdominal exams were unremarkable as well. There are no obvious skeletal abnormalities. The child appears to be developmentally appropriate based on your history and observations. After you are done the physical exam, you please have to ask if this child meets the diagnosis criteria for NF1. Although NF1 is a genetic disorder, genetic testing is often not required for diagnosis. Instead, there is a set of criteria that can be used to diagnose NF1. Two or more of the following are required to make the diagnosis. Number one, six or more cafe au lait spots greater than 0.5 centimeters in diameter if prepubertal or greater than 1.5 centimeters in diameter in postpubertal children. Cafe au lait spots are discrete, uniformly pigmented macules or patches varying from light to dark brown with smooth or irregular borders. In general, cafe au lait spots are more common in African American and Hispanic children versus Caucasian children, 
Therefore, in Caucasian children, more than three spots should prompt evaluation. Number two, two or more cutaneous neurofibromas or one plexiform neurofibroma. Plexiform neurofibromas present as a soft plaque with overlying hyperpigmentation with or without hypertrichosis. It has the potential for malignant transformation, which can manifest as tenderness over the lesion. It can involve all skin levels down to the bone and viscera. It may cause compression, distortion, or overgrowth of structures. Number three, freckling in the inguinal and or axillary region. Number four, optic gliomas. Optic gliomas are the most common CNS tumor in NF1. They occur in 15% of children younger than six eight years of age with NF1. They rarely occur in older children and adults. The patient can present with headache, visual field defects, proptosis, strabismus, nausea, anorexia, hypothalamic dysfunction, and precocious puberty. Number five, two or more Lish nodules on the iris, which are hamartomas of the iris. It may require a slit lamp exam to diagnose, but they do not affect vision. Number six, osseous lesions, including sphenoid dysplasia and thinning of long bones. Number seven, a first degree relative with NF1. If you recall, your patient has only five cafe au lait spots that are greater than five millimeters in diameter and does not currently meet the diagnostic criteria for NF1. It is important to note that the presentation of NF1 might progress over time. Patients can often present with only a few cafe au lait spots. Other manifestations of NF1, including freckling, neurofibromas, Lish nodules or gliomas tend to present later in childhood or after puberty, making it essential to do regular skin exams and follow all patients closely if a neurocutaneous disorder is suspected. After reviewing NF1 presentation diagnosis with your preceptor, they ask you if you know what the other most common neurocutaneous disorder is. You know that it is tuberous sclerosis, but cannot quite remember the long list of diagnostic criteria. Let's review that now. There are both major features and minor features. To make a definitive diagnosis, you need two major features or one major with at least two minor features. A definitive diagnosis can also be made through genetic testing. For possible diagnosis, you need one major feature or at least two minor features. The major features are 1. At least three hypomelanotic macules with greater than 5 mm diameter, known as ash leaf spot. 2. Three or more angiofibromas or one fibrocephalic plaque. 3. Two or more oncofibromas. 4. Chagrin patch. Chagrin patch are a connective tissue nevus that is skin colored and occurs on the back and buttocks. 5. Multiple retinal hematomas. Hematomas are abnormal growth of tissue. 6. Cortical dysplasia including tubers. 7. Subependymal nodules. The minor features are 1. Confatty skin lesions. 2. At least 3 dental enamel peats. 3. At least 2 intraoral fibromas. 4. Retinal a chromic patch. Five, multiple renal cysts. Six, non-renal hematomas. Please refer to the PEDS cases on tuberous sclerosis for more information, including a clinical case. You are back in the same community clinic as a new resident during your pediatrics rotation. You are asked to see a three-year-old male for a well child check and are told to pay close attention to the skin exam. You notice the name looks familiar, and you realize it's the same patient you saw in clinic a few years ago. Over the last few years, there has been no concerns. He is on track for his development, his immunizations are up to date, and his growth is tracking appropriately. You begin your exam starting with the skin exam. You notice 11 cafe au lait spots that range from 0.6 centimeters to 1.5 centimeters in diameter. You also notice that his axillae have some freckling. 
there are no neurofibromas and no visible plexiform neurofibromas. Since this patient was suspected of having NF1 earlier, he was sent for yearly eye exams as a precaution. His eye exam a month ago was normal. Skeletal exam is normal with no bony abnormalities. As the number of cafe au lait spots has increased and this patient now has axillary freckling, you are now able to diagnose him with NF1. His parents were already counseled on what NF1 is when he initially presented for his well child check over two years ago. But as it was not clinically confirmed, you had a teaching session with them now that it has become relevant. You reviewed the different terms, the necessity for multidisciplinary involvement, and reiterated the importance of regular follow-up appointments. Children with NF1 need to be closely followed for further manifestations of the disorder. As NF1 tends to progress throughout childhood and adolescence, children need to be frequently reassessed at least yearly for new skin lesions, growth of previously identified lesions, skeletal changes, and hypertension. In addition, children with NF1 should undergo a yearly ophthalmologic exam to assess for vision changes. There is controversy around the need for MRI screening for brain tumors and lesions in the optic chiasm. Given the fact that MRI could pick up nonspecific or questionable findings leading to more invasive testing or anxiety amongst family members, routine screening MRIs are not recommended as per current guidelines. However, children with NF1 should be sent for MRI if any neural manifestations arise, including headaches, seizures, vision changes, and precocious puberty. In addition, there should be a clear discussion between families and physicians regarding the risks and benefits before the imaging studies. Most children with NF1 will have normal and typical development and cognition. However, up to 8% of children with NF1 can exhibit learning difficulties and varying degrees of intellectual disability, making it essential to follow the neurodevelopmental progress and screen for learning disabilities, especially in the realm of math skills. Managing a patient with NF1 often requires a multidisciplinary approach that can involve multiple medical specialists in addition to allied healthcare professionals. More specifically, all patients will need a family doctor or pediatrician for regular follow-up, as well as an ophthalmologist. In addition, children with previous history of seizures most likely will need to be assessed regularly by a neurologist. The overall care of a child with NF1 or other neurocutaneous disorders could be very complex, and the key to comprehensive care is to ensure effective communication among healthcare professionals along with community partners, including teachers and other caregivers. Today, we we'll review the two most common neurocutaneous disorders, NF1 and TS. Both disorders are autosomal dominant, with most cases occurring de novo. NF1 and TS present with characteristic skin lesions with NF1 presenting with hyperpigmented cafe au lait spots and TS presenting with hypopigmented ash leaf spots. Neurocutaneous disorders have a wide range of presentation with all affecting the skin and nervous system as well as other systems. As mentioned in the case, patients may not meet diagnostic criteria for neurocutaneous disorders at the initial presentation. This makes regular follow-up and monitoring essential to make diagnosis as early as possible. Check out www.pedscases.com for more great podcasts, videos, interactive cases, questions, and more. Press subscribe on iTunes to get access to all of our podcasts. If you like what we do, please leave a review on the iTunes store. Share with your friends and colleagues or think about getting involved.